lesson we're going to delve more deeply into the floating exchange rate system. We'll talk about how exchange rates in a floating system are determined by changes in the demand and the supply of currencies on foreign exchange markets. In our last lesson we defined exchange rate and we introduced the foreign exchange market by looking at the market for dollars in Europe and the market for euros in the United States. In this lesson we're going to talk more about the determinants of the value of a currency expressed in terms of another. To help you remember the determinants of exchange rates I've come up with a useful acronym that is TIPSY. Each of these letters represents one of the determinants of exchange rates and we'll start with the T. The T stands for tastes and preferences of domestic and foreign consumers. This is quite simple. In our market for US dollars in Europe we can give an example of how the tastes of European consumers might shift towards American goods. If Europeans start to enjoy the consumption of American goods more, for example, if American cars become more fashionable in Europe, then demand for dollars might increase. On the other hand, if European tastes and preferences shift away from American goods, then demand for dollars might decrease. If there were a decrease in demand for dollars due to a change in Europeans' tastes and preferences, it would look like this in our graph. We would see Europeans demanding less dollars since they are demanding fewer American imports. This would cause a depreciation of the dollar to ER1. In the United States, we would see the supply of euros coming into the United States decrease as Europeans are demanding less American goods. As the supply of euros decreased, the euro would become scarcer and would appreciate in the US market for euros to ER1. Since consumers are a major demander of currencies, a change in the tastes and preferences of consumers can lead to a change in the demand for foreign exchange. The I is the second determinant of exchange rates and that stands for relative interest rates. Now who sets interest rates? If you've already studied macroeconomics, you know that the main determinant of interest rates in a particular country is central bank policy. So let's tell a story here where a change in interest rates by the European Central Bank can lead to a change in the value of the euro on foreign exchange markets. Assume that the European Central Bank raised interest rates, in other words, enacted a contractionary monetary policy. How would higher interest rates affect the demand and or the supply of euros in the United States? Well, it's not consumers who are going to respond to higher interest rates in Europe. It's investors. And we learned in our previous lesson that investors are a major demander and supplier of foreign exchange. If interest rates on European assets, included in European banks, are higher due to a contractionary monetary policy, American investors will demand more European assets. In order to put their money in European banks or buy European government bonds, which now have higher returns, there will be an increase in demand for euros in the United States. And since a green curve shift in our graph on the bottom, the green curve in the graph on the right would shift as well. In order to acquire the euros needed to invest in the now higher yield European assets, Americans would have to supply more dollars in the European market for US dollars. The change in interest rates in Europe caused demand for euros to rise and the appreciation of the euro against the dollar. Likewise, higher interest rates in Europe led Americans to exchange some of their dollars for euros, causing the supply of dollars to increase in Europe and a depreciation of the dollar. Now, the important thing to keep in mind here is that this is relative interest rates. If both the European Central Bank and the United States Central Bank, the Fed, raise interest rates simultaneously by the same degree, it's uncertain how the exchange rate between the euro and the dollar would be affected, since there would be a flow both into and out of the United States as a result of the change in interest rates. However, ceteris paribus, if country A lowers its interest rate compared to country B, there would likely be a depreciation of country A's currency. If country A raised its interest rate relative to country B, there would be an increase in the value of country A's currency. Investors want to put their money where interest rates are higher. Therefore, an increase in relative interest rates will cause an appreciation of a country's currency. On the other hand, a decrease in relative interest rates will cause a depreciation. When I say relative, I mean relative to another country. Investors want to put their money where interest rates are higher. If interest rates go up, investment will flow into a country. If interest rates go down, investment will flow out of a country. That brings us to the P in our acronym here. P stands for relative price levels. 
or inflation rates is another way to think of this. How would a change in relative inflation rates between Europe and the United States affect the exchange rate of the euro and the dollar? Well, this goes back to consumers. Let's talk about a scenario where America's inflation rate is rising relative to Europe's. How will American consumers react to an increase in their inflation rate while Europe's inflation rate remains stable? The higher inflation in America would lead American consumers to wish to substitute more European goods for the now higher priced American goods. So an increase in inflation should cause a depreciation of the currency. Thinking about our example here, higher inflation in the United States will cause Americans to demand more euros and buy more European goods. This would cause an increase in the demand for euros, again, out to D2 now, and an increase in supply of dollars, out to S2. Higher inflation in America led Americans to wish to buy more European goods, demanding more euros, causing the euro to appreciate yet again. And that increase in demand for euros led to an increase in the supply of dollars, causing the dollar to depreciate. We could have told a similar story in reverse. If inflation in Europe had become negative or had decreased relative to Americas, this would have caused an appreciation of the euro in the United States. So a decrease in inflation should cause an appreciation. Foreigners would demand more of your relatively cheaper goods. So higher inflation should cause a depreciation of the currency. Lower inflation should cause an appreciation of the currency. And this all goes back to consumers at home and abroad who will choose to substitute foreign goods in the case of higher inflation and consume more domestic goods in case of lower inflation. The S in Tipsy stands for speculation. Speculation refers to investors who buy and sell a currency not in order to invest in a foreign country or to buy foreign goods, rather because they expect the value of that currency to change in the future. So speculation has less to do with the demand for imports and exports or financial assets. Rather, it has to do with the demand for the currency itself. So we can say that the expectation of an appreciation should cause demand for a currency to rise and an appreciation. I know that sounds silly, but in a way, the expectation of an appreciation of a currency, if enough people expect it, will lead to speculation in the foreign exchange market as foreign exchange investors buy more of that currency, causing the very appreciation that they expected to happen in the first place. On the other hand, the expectation of a depreciation will cause supply to increase as investors who hold that currency want to dump it before it gets weaker and a depreciation. So a major determinant of exchange rates is actually the speculation among foreign investors. Now, this is a floating exchange rate system. If your country has a managed or a fixed exchange rate, then speculation will not happen, and this cannot cause a depreciation or an appreciation of your currency. So this is not possible under a fixed or managed exchange rate system. The last letter in Tipsy, the Y, stands for relative income levels. Now, if you've studied economics for a while, you know that Y is the abbreviation for income. Let's do one last example here. Let's assume that European incomes are rising faster than American incomes. The European economy is outperforming America's, and Europeans now have more disposable income with which to buy imports. As European incomes rise, the demand for dollars in Europe would rise because Europeans would be buying more American imports. This would cause the supply of euros in the United States to rise, and an appreciation of the dollar and a depreciation of the euro. An increase in relative incomes at home will cause a depreciation of your currency abroad as domestic consumers demand more imports. On the other hand, if Europe falls into a recession and America remains strong, European demand for American imports will fall, causing a depreciation of the dollar and an appreciation of the euro. So we can say a decrease in relative incomes, which may be expressed as GDP growth rates, should cause an appreciation of the domestic currency as domestic consumers demand fewer imports. Here we've got the five primary determinants of floating exchange rates including the tastes and preferences of domestic and foreign consumers, relative interest rates, relative price levels, speculation, and relative income levels. Changes in any of these variables can cause the demand and the supply of a currency to change on the Forex market and a corresponding increase or decrease in the value of that currency. So we're now going to conclude with some evaluation of the advantages and disadvantages of a floating exchange rate system.
one major advantage of a floating exchange rate system is that there will be relatively balanced trade between one nation and the rest of the world. What this means is persistent deficits or surpluses in trade will not exist. If a country's currency is allowed to appreciate and depreciate based on demand and supply for that currency, then any time foreigners demand more of that country's exports, its currency will get stronger, leading to a decrease in demand for those exports abroad, and the trade balance will move back towards zero. On the other hand, if demand for a country's exports is falling and its trade balance becomes negative, then the currency will depreciate and that country's goods will become more attractive abroad again, causing the trade balance to move back towards zero. Another advantage of a floating exchange rate system is that central bank policy is allowed to be used for domestic macroeconomic policy objectives. To understand this one, you must know that in order to manage an exchange rate, a central bank must use interest rates not to control domestic aggregate demand, but to control the value of the currency in foreign exchange markets. So changes in interest rate can be reserved to manage domestic aggregate demand and not the exchange rate. In our next lesson, we'll talk about how under a managed exchange rate system, central banks must constantly be adjusting interest rates in order to manage the flow of foreign exchange in and out of the country. Under a floating exchange rate system, central banks are free to use domestic monetary policy for domestic macroeconomic demand management. These are the two primary advantages of a floating exchange rate system. That doesn't mean this system has no disadvantages, however. Two of the disadvantages of floating exchange rates are uncertainty among international investors. If a developing country, for example, is hoping to attract foreign investment in its infrastructure or its manufacturing sector, wild fluctuations in exchange rates lead to uncertainty among international investors about how well their investments will pay off in the future. Investors who are uncertain about whether a currency will appreciate or depreciate in the future might hesitate to invest in a developing country. This is why we often see less developed countries manage their exchange rates against major currencies like the US dollar or the euro. This would be to attract investment from America or Europe in the domestic economy. A floating exchange rate tends to be more volatile than a managed exchange rate. Volatility is clearly not desirable among international investors. A second disadvantage of the floating exchange rate system is the chance that a depreciation will lead to imported inflation. Imported inflation would occur when a currency's value depreciates against those of its trading partners unexpectedly. In such a case, all imported raw materials, manufactured goods, services, and technologies would become more expensive, and the weaker currency would lead to a higher inflation rate domestically. So if a country depends on imported goods or technology, a volatile floating exchange rate could lead to swings in the domestic price level. Countries often opt for managed exchange rate systems when they prefer stability over uncertainty and volatility. For example, if a country is trying to increase the size of its export sector, a floating exchange rate may not be in its best interest. Keeping the currency unnaturally weak through a managed or fixed exchange rate system would certainly help domestic exporting firms, whereas under a floating exchange rate system, as demand for the country's exports rises, the currency would get stronger and that export sector's growth might be limited due to an appreciation of the currency. So let's go back and review what we've looked at in this lesson. I've taught you an acronym to help you remember the determinants of exchange rates. TIPSY, which stands for Tastes and Preferences, Relative Interest Rates, Relative Price Levels, Speculation, and Relative Income Levels. Changes in any of these variables can cause a country's currency to appreciate or depreciate under a floating exchange rate system. We've also evaluated the floating exchange rate system by identifying two advantages and two disadvantages of such a system. Relatively balanced trade, in other words, the lack of persistent deficits or surpluses in trade, will not exist under a floating exchange rate system due to changes in the currency affecting the demand for imports and exports. Central banks will also be able to use monetary policy to manage domestic aggregate demand rather than for managing the exchange rate. Disadvantages are primarily around uncertainty and the volatility that often accompanies floating exchange rate systems. In our next lesson, we'll talk about the managed exchange rate system, how a country can manage the value of its currency, and the advantages and disadvantages of a managed exchange rate system. Here we go. Whoa.